I'm Nani Moore, a member of the lecture committee. And before I start, there's some people we need to thank. Uh, we need to thank Rena Leibovitz, who brought this idea to us and helped coordinate it. Uh, we need to thank Buck Dillon from the computer committee, who agreed to help uh, Helen and Walter put their slides together. And without that, you know, it wouldn't be a full lecture, would it? Anyway, we, we really appreciate the help of the computer committee because a lot of the people, the residents that we're having speaking, uh, don't have experience with PowerPoint points and things like that. So, um, And now we're really honored. Oh, also Eileen and her team. I know that uh, Cassie is out there. She's taken my place taking names. Um, and now we're honored to present these two residents who have quite a personal story to share. Some of them stories probably you've heard. Most of them you probably haven't. I know they, they haven't given presentations like this to our community before. I'd like to introduce the two speakers for today, and what better way to introduce them than in their own words. Walter. This is Walter. I was born in Austria in 1930. When I was eight, my family was uprooted, robbed, and expelled from their homeland. We ended up in Shanghai, China, because the world was closed to Jews without means. In 1940, my paternal grandparents were able to join us, thanks to Chiyune Sugihara a Japanese diplomat in Lithuania who, against orders from his government, issued some 2,000 exit visas to Jews. When Japan became allied with Germany, we were uprooted, and we lived in dire conditions in the ghetto until war, war's end. I started work at 14. Grandfather died due to lack of medication, Mother had tuberculosis and was denied entry to the U.S. when we applied in 1948. And then Walter will speak on that. And here is Helen's in her own words. My name is Helen Resnick, and I live in Villa 69 with my husband, Ted. We've been in Stone Ridge for seven years and are very happy here. I was born in France and came to the U.S. in 1949 when I was 14. I would like to share with you what it was like living in France under German occupation during the Second World War. Because I was a Jewish child, and only because I was Jewish, I had to hide, separated from my parents for almost two years. I survived thanks to the help of righteous Gentiles. So now we're going to hear each one's story, and after each person has spoken, we'll be able to take questions. So good morning. Um, I'm Dixon's caregiver. <laughs> <laughs> and I, before I start, I want, want to ask one question. Has anyone in this audience been here in the week before? Oh. So actually only one or two, so I don't have to worry about the fact check, do I? <laughs> okay, so anyhow, um, I was born in Austria. We lived in a small town, uh, Leoben. Uh, I, I guess it was a normal childhood, uh, except when I started uh, going to school, I guess it must have been at age six or seven. Uh, School was okay, I learned well, but I really hated Wednesdays because on Wednesdays there was a real religious ed class for an hour and being Jewish I was excused from that class and uh, another boy whose name I no longer remember uh, and I were given separate instruction uh, by a Jewish person, possibly a rabbi. Anyhow, after school was really dangerous because we were always chased home because us Jews had just killed Christ, Jesus Christ, and uh, so it wasn't a pleasant day on Wednesdays. 
when the Germans uh, marched in and um, took over Austria, the population was very happy about it. I remember big celebrations and welcoming speeches and all that. Uh, for Jewish people, it wasn't such good news. Um, shortly after the Anschluss, my father was called into the Gestapo office and uh, pretty much had to give up all his property. He had a store, we had an apartment, and pretty much everything was stripped from us. And uh, the Gestapo officer asked my father, uh, what about this? Uh, you had, he had let, my father had lent some money to his parents, uh, uh, and he took out a mortgage, uh, or, you know, as they signed a mortgage over to him so that for his security. Anyhow, the Gestapo officer asked, asked him to resign or sign off on that money, uh, and he asked him, well, why should I do that? And he was told, well, if you don't do it, you're on your way to a concentration camp right now, and who knows if you'll ever come back. So my father gladly signed over, and we had to make uh, arrangements to leave Austria because that was part of the condition that he was being released, that we had to leave Austria within, and I don't know how, weeks. So the problem was, well, two problems. One, we didn't have any money, and two, no country in the world uh, welcomed or allowed uh, Jewish refugees to enter unless they had a lot of money. If you have a lot of money, uh, the people get to love you a lot more than what they hated you without money. <laughs> so, I don't know how my father managed it, but uh, he arranged, possibly borrowed from relatives, um, the money for our fare to Shanghai, China. Um, uh, my father always related how family members always criticized him for taking a young family to a country where you don't know the language, you don't have any money, and there's a war going on, because at that time there's war all around Shanghai between the Japanese and the Chinese. Anyhow, uh, was a good decision, because the only decision that was really possible. Uh, prior to leaving, my father decided that he wanted to trade himself into something other than being a businessman, a storekeeper, a retail store. So there is a Jewish organization, uh, the ORT, and they offer classes to, all over the world to people who need to retrain. He went and took a course in making soap, laundry soap, and uh, proudly brought home several bars of the soap he had made, and a couple of weeks later, the soap started growing something that looked like a white beard. <laughs> the soap was coming apart, so he went back to the instructor and he says, say, what's with this soap? And the instructor said, Mr. Gehring, this soap isn't for washing, it's for selling. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he didn't become a soap maker. <laughs> so anyhow, we took a train from Austria across the Alps into Italy. Uh, I remember chasing pigeons in Venice and uh, uh, eventually we boarded ship, I think it was in Genoa, uh, an Italian luxury cruiser. Uh, uh, I don't think we took the best class, but um, it, it, it was a good trip. It was, uh, we left Italy, went through the Mediterranean, through the Suez Canal, uh, we landed in Bombay in India, I think it was there, uh, and my father had somehow scouted out the Jewish community in India, and he and us went to visit a fairly or very wealthy individual, and he, my father begged for money from him, and he was given 10 English pounds, which doesn't sound like a lot, but 
it, it was quite a considerable sum of money. I also remember getting sick on the way back to the ship. It's amazing the things that one remembers. So we, we made our way to Shanghai, we landed, and a little bit of an explanation. In Shanghai, I believe it was a town of about three million inhabitants at the time, there were a number of foreign communities. Uh, uh, there was a Russian community, a French community, an English, an American community. I think people from all countries of the world. It was a very international and cosmopolitan town. The town was also divided into what was called the French Concession and the International Settlement. Um, the International Settlement was controlled primarily by the British and the Americans and I imagine the Germans also. Uh, we were map oh, they also had a number of Jewish communities there, very, fairly distinct from each other. There was a, a Russian Jewish community. Those were Jews who had escaped Russia earlier during the Bolshevik re Revolution after World War I. There was Sephardic or Iraqi Jews who had come up from Iraq through Hong Kong, Singapore, and established themselves in Shanghai. Some of them were extremely wealthy. So, so anyhow, when we landed in Shanghai, there was a Jewish committee that uh, met us. We were put on trucks, and we were driven, standing up, I remember, uh, for a long, long time. And uh, we passed streets of burnt out and bombed out houses, houses in ruins. Finally, we arrived in Hongqiu, which is a section of town, and we were given a room uh, with uh, one bed in it, and I remember sleeping sideways because there's five of us and we didn't fit lengthwise. <laughs> so we stayed there for a little bit of time, uh, maybe a week, 10 days, two weeks, I don't know. Uh, after which we moved into the French concession. And again, how my father arranged these things, I will never know, because we rented an, an apartment from a Russian Jewish person who had a store downstairs, and that person not only rented to us where we had no way to pay the rent, but he also advanced my dad some money to where he could open a store. So we were doing pretty well financially in, in, in Shanghai prior to the uh, Pearl Harbor. My father was also able to arrange for my grandparents who had been deported from Austria to Poland. They made their way up to Lithuania and met the Japanese consul who issued them a transit visa. The Japanese didn't want to allow the people in, but they had something called a transit visa. If you had an end destination, they would give you that. So grandparents had uh, Shanghai, so they got this. They went by train across Russia, Siberia, and then by ship to Japan, to I believe Kobe, and from Kobe by ship to Shanghai. They moved in with us into the apartment. I believe it was a two-room apartment, but there was Somehow, there was enough space. When the Pacific War started after the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, nothing really changed for us for a little bit other than there were shortages of gasoline, which we didn't care about, we had no car, but uh, things got a little bit tighter. The Germans eventually, I guess, the Nazis realized there was a Jewish community in Shanghai who had managed to escape their clutches. And so they, being allies now with the Japanese, uh, they sent a diplomat who tried to or talk to the Japanese authorities to kind of oppress us and basically do away with us. Um, eventually, there was a proclamation, I think it was in 1942, that said that all refugees 
that came after a certain date, which was us, had to move into a designated area. So basically a ghetto. So once again, my father had to sell the store that he had. We had to give up the apartment and move into, and the ghetto was lo located in the slums, in the slum area of, San, of uh, Shanghai. Eventually we moved into a corner house. The, the store was at the bottom. On the first floor lived my grandparents and my two brothers. On the second fl flight up was my father and my mother. And I got a folding bed in the store, which had to be folded up every morning. Uh, so I was basically well, not homeless, but bedless for half the time. <laughs> um, I should also say that when we arrived, we were enrolled in the Shanghai Jewish School, which was a school pattern after the English or British pattern. The instruction was in English. And um, I think it was a very good school because I think I learned a lot. But what I couldn't quite un at the time didn't even think about. We had French lessons and English lessons, and after the Pacific War started, the Japanese lessons, we had to do that. Why we didn't have Chinese language lessons uh, at the t uh, never occurred to us. Uh, when I think back on it, it seems such an idiotic thing. Here, we're like 20,000 Central European Jewish pe people who spoke German, and most of them learned English, and there's three million Chinese, and we didn't learn Chinese, so if we want to talk to them, they'd better learn German. It, it, it's a European insanity, I think. Or, uh, it was also, I think, the fact that the European powers had defeated the Chinese earlier and imposed the concessions on the Chinese, and and the colonial masters, I think, looked down on the Chinese, and we looked like the masters, so we, anyhow, we, if I, I should have learned Chinese, one of the regrets that I now have on my life that I didn't. Um, one day, when I was about 14 years old, my father says, come Walter, come with me. So we went, and he brought me to a place, and he says, this is where you now work, and he introduced me to uh, my boss, uh, fellow by Stern, Mr. Stern. It was a f fur store where luxury furs, fur coats were made, and I became an apprentice. I didn't have much say about the thing. Um, I think it was a time, either that or my father was such a strong personality that if he said, jump, I jumped. If he said, don't jump, I didn't jump. No, never came into my mind to question him that it would have possibly be more fun or better for me to stay in school. So I went to work, um, learned the, uh, the fur trade, and um, um, there was a labor camp across the street from our uh, the factory or the work, work group where we worked, and one day for some reason, all the curtains were drawn, but we kind of peeked out, and it was a Japanese camp, and they were torturing a Chinese person, a man. I don't know why, whether he had been stealing, whether they felt nasty or whatever, but waterboarding doesn't seem very, very nice. Um, as time went on, things got tighter and tighter in, in Shanghai. Food became scarce, and when the, we were in the ghetto, there's all, the chances to make a living were very limited. There was a, an office set up at Japanese to where you could apply for permission to leave the ghetto, which people really wanted to because you could make a living by going outside the ghetto. Uh, there was a Japanese by the name of Goya, a very short man, who, uh, when especially a, a tall person came, 
and asked for the pass, he jumped on the table and said, I'm bigger than you, and hit the guy. So the people didn't like to go, but necessity is the mother of whatever. So we actually did not have walls around the ghetto, but we did have guards who were supplied by the community at the behest of the Japanese. So it was relatively easy to sneak out of the ghetto, but it was also very easy to be caught because you didn't look like the rest of the population. <laughs> so towards the, in, I think it was in 1943, my grandfather died. He, may, he must have had some kind of a stomach or abdominal cancer because he really moaned all the day. He was in great pain. There was no pain medication available other than aspirin, and he died in agony and he was buried in Shanghai. His cemetery was uprooted when the communists took over, and so we don't know where his bones are. Um, uh, in July of, towards the end of the war, um, the ghetto was bombed. Apparently there was a Japanese radio station that di directed ship traffic in and out of the port and American B-17 bombed it. Unfortunately, they missed the radio station and hit the ghetto. And uh, we lost, I think, 17 died and 250 wounded of the foreign population, plus many, many Chinese. Um, I remember after the bombing, uh, uh, I went out to see you know, what could be done, and uh, that's the only time in my entire life that I saw a head of a person without a body lying in a basket of peaches. Oh. Uh, I don't remember much of the rest of the day. Um, anyhow, as the war progressed, things got tighter and tighter. We were supported by an organization called the American Jewish Joint. Uh, and very cleverly, they were able to send money to Shanghai, even though it was prohibited by the United States under an act called Trading with the Enemy. So they couldn't send money to Shanghai because it was Japanese territory, but they did send it to, I think, Switzerland, being a neutral country, and from there, I guess, we, you, you grease enough hands, everything is possible. Anyhow, I think of the 20,000 refugees that we had, we must have had 15,000 uh, getting assistance, financial and assistance from the joint. Uh, uh, and uh, that organization is still, still in existence now. Um, after the bombing, uh, and that was actually fairly close to the end of the war, I think within three or four months, um, we continued our existence. Uh, I remember the work kind. Of my my the place I worked is kind of went on a part-time basis. Uh, there wasn't that much to do. Um, there was also huge inflation. Uh, I got paid, and I could have easily have used one of our lunch bags that we have to fill up with paper currency. Uh, we didn't count the money because it was tied up in bills with a, a string, and it said 10,000 or 20,000. No, no one bothered to count it. Um, when, when the war, ended and it became known what had gone on in Europe, my fa the parents decided that they did not or could not go back to Austria to restart their lives. And uh, so we, my f father was able to secure an affidavit, which is a guarantee that we will not become a burden on the state from a distant relative of my mother's. Actually, that relative and my mother were very good friends in another lifetime. And so she uh, 
guaranteed house assistance, and we got visas. Unfortunately, my mother had developed a TB in Shanghai, and uh, the United States would not allow her in. So uh, she went for treatment, and every ship that left, and there was a ship leaving Shanghai with well, probably every few weeks, uh, and we postponed from one ship to the next, to the next, uh, with the thought that possibly she might be cured or get better, or there might be a change, or anyhow, the time came for the visas to end, and um, I, I know that my parents lied to us kids, because they said to us, she's going to be on the next ship, and we departed, and of course she wasn't on the next ship and never saw her again. Um, so what am I leaving out? Anyhow, um, we arrived in the States, and again we were met by a Jewish committee. We were settled in Richmond, California, and uh, here, here I am. <laughs> were you in school in Shanghai and what were you taught? I was enrolled in the Shanghai Jewish School at age 8, from 8 to 14. What I learned was English, math, grammar. The thing that I really hated was poetry because I have a dysfunction in my brain. I cannot learn or remember poetry. <laughs> my memory is pretty good if I can just tell you the facts, but to, uh, I also hated grammar for the same reason. Um, we learned French and history and geography, all the grammar school subjects, uh, I guess. And as I said before, to my great sorrow, I didn't learn Chinese. What career did you follow when you came? To the U.S. Okay, for, first I got a job as a furrier. Um, my second week, one of the fellow workers approached me and says, you know, there's a union here. So I went to the union meeting and I discovered that I was being paid half of what everyone else was being paid. So I approached the boss and I said, you know, I'm in the union now. I he says, no, you're not, you're fired. <laughs> so I, I learned the lesson, I, and I went to a different first store where I worked for two years until the uh, uh, United States Army got, got me for two years. When I was discharged, I knew for sure I did not want to go back into the fur business, and I finally found a job with Burroughs Corporation, fixing business machines, adding machines, and so on. Um, by then, I worked for Burroughs for 10 years. I uh, loved the job, I loved the work, I was good at it, but uh, uh, the pay wasn't quite, I could, could see no future. So again, I got involved in the union organization, and uh, we lost the vote, and I knew for sure that I had no future in that company. So I looked around and eventually ended up working for a potential insurance company selling insur life insurance and health insurance and mutual funds and so on for the next 30 years. Uh, I was born in Paris in 1935. Uh, uh, the Germans invade, the Germans, I'm sorry. The war started in Europe in 1939. And my father immediately joined the army. And I have a picture of my father. Uh, that's my brother and my mother. And my father was very proud, of course. And uh, that was, he came on to take a picture that was on his first leave 
And after that, he went away, and I didn't see him again for a very long time. Uh, the Germans invaded Paris in 1940. By that time, my father was already a prisoner of war in Germany. And um, I don't remember that much of my time in Paris at the time, except fear. We were afraid of, we were afraid to tell, say, I was, was told not to tell I was Jewish. And uh, they started to impose all kinds of uh, restrictions on Jews. And the first thing they did was to close the public schools. So we went to a Catholic school for a while. That was my first exposure to learning about Catholicism. And um, they, the Jews were supposed to register at the local police station, and my mother refused. And I found out much later that the Jews who did not register actually did much better statistically than the Jews who did register. Germans soon started to arrest people, and uh, it was getting to be difficult to stay in Paris, and we wanted to try to join my father. Jews were not allowed to travel, so it was difficult to get to um, my father. France was divided into two zones. Uh, the Germans in, were in the north, and the south, which was known as Vichy France, or the Free Zone. And that was headed by Pétain. Pétain was a World War I hero, and he was beloved by the French. And now he collaborated with the Germans and uh, to get power, and he was the head of uh, the South of France. He did one good thing. He arranged with the Germans to release prisoners, and the first prisoners who were released were um, sick prisoners. And so my father was released to a hospital first, and uh, he sent us a postcard. Well, it's, it could see that it said from now, over here, it says hospital, and he sent that to Paris. Can you turn it over? to the other side? Okay. This is as much as he was allowed to write. Uh, on top it says, uh, I am in good health. It's printed, in good health. And at the bottom it says, I'm back from Germany. I think I'll be able to come home soon. And don't worry and kiss the children. That's as much as he was allowed to write. Anyway, as I said, we were not, Jews were not allowed to travel and get to the South. And uh, my, when my, and I don't know how my parents communicated, but somehow or other it was decided that we should get there. So I was the first one to go. Um, a woman, the, the sister of my father's boss, um, volunteered, she was going to Paris on a trip. And she agreed to take me back. <clears throat> so I was rehearsed for several days, <clears throat> excuse me, with a false name. And I was supposed to say that she was my aunt. And um, so that went on for several days. And then she took me by train. And fortunately, they did not stop me. And they didn't ask me anything, which was a good thing because my mother told me, and I don't remember this, but my mother told me that if they had asked me my name, I would have told them that my real name, because it's not nice to lie. Well, that's, that's as much as you can trust children. But I got there to, have, to Avignon, and uh, I was very happy to see my dad. And my mother and my brother came a little later, they, you had to pay somebody, a passer, to get you across the border with bullets uh, over your head, as my mother always said. And um, when I watch television and I see how the migrants come over the border today, I think about it all the time. 
But here we are in Avignon, and there are no Germans, and you can breathe free for a little while. And I went to school, and uh, the, most of the, the kids were going to catechism during lunch. The French had a two-hour break, and they had catechism. I don't remember how many times a week. And they asked me why I wasn't going, so I decided to go. And uh, I wanted to be a Catholic anyway. Who the heck wanted to be Jewish? It was a lot of trouble. So I went to catechism for a while, and my parents were not too happy about that, and I stopped going. And that didn't last long. The Germans decided that half of France is not good enough for them, and they're going to come and invade the rest of it. That I remember very clearly. I remember them marching in and they were all over the place. And uh, <clears throat> I have a couple of personal remembrances of those days. As I said, I was going to school, and one day <clears throat> the teacher told me to not to go out and wait, and she took me on her lap, and she asked me if I was Jewish. And I said, no, I'm not. And she asked me several times, are you sure you're not Jewish? And I said, no, I'm not Jewish, I'm a Catholic. So she said, okay, and she let me go. And to this day, I do not know why she did that. I don't know if she wanted to help me, or she wanted to turn me in, I don't know. The other thing I remember from that time is one time I was running in the street, and I fell, and I hurt my knee, I was bleeding. And a German soldier picked me up, and he was speaking French, and he wanted to take me home. And I kept saying, no, no, I don't want to. And he said, but I'll take you home. I'm not going to hurt you. I said, no, no, no. And I just wrenched myself away from him, and I ran home. So those are the things that I remember from that time in Avignon. But, of course, things started to get bad, and they started to arrest Jews in Avignon. And the time had come for us to go into hiding. And it was easier to hide children. And uh, there was an organization in France called Oeuvre uh, de Secours aux Enfants. Their job, they were all over Europe. And their, their job was to uh, try to uh, help children, save children. So you could, one of the choices was a convent. And the other choice was to go to the country. And my mother didn't like the idea of a convent, so she thought going to the country was better. So my brother and I were taken to a farm uh, in the middle of nowhere. And there were four farms. Uh, I was in one farm, my brother was in another farm. And two of my cousins were in the third farm. They had gotten there before we did. And the fourth farm had another Jewish child. The, the farm was near a town called the Chambon sur Lignon. You have a, you can see where it is here. And the Chambon, the, the pastor of the town of the Chambon sur Lignon. His name was André Trocmé. And the pastor of that town, this was a Protestant area of France, I forgot to mention. It was a, a Protestant, they called themselves Huguenots. And the Protestants uh, had had a lot of trouble from the Catholics. Uh, and so they were more understanding of the problems of the Jews. And this André Trocmé told his congregation that the Jews were the children of God, and it was a Christian duty to try to save us. And he did a, a lot of work. He had an orphanage in which he had a lot of Jewish children. And he also helped children go through to border to Switzerland. And altogether, with all the children that were put in the farms all around the area, and the orphanage, and going to Switzerland, he managed to save 4,000 Jewish children. 
So we, he's quite well known. He, there were books written about him, and there was even a movie made about him. I was taken in by a woman, an older woman called uh, Madame Mondon. Uh, I never knew her first name. It wasn't a style in those days. And um, she treated me well, but I was very unhappy, of course. My brother was right next door, and he was with a family, so I envied him. I was all alone with her, and I was very, I was lonely. And uh, she didn't like me to go out and play with the other children. I didn't really understand why, but she was being very protective. And uh, things were just so different from what I was used to in Paris. You know, on the farms, they had electricity, but... They didn't have water. You had to go to a well to get water. They had uh, a stove, a wooden stove, in, in just in the main room. And it was very, very cold. And uh, I cried all the time. I cried every night. And she took me to her bed with her, which, was, which I didn't like at first, but then it was very comforting. And so... Uh, as I said, I tried my best. And we went to school. Oh, she took us to the Chambon sur Lignon to take a picture. She, I guess she wanted us to remember her. And she was right, because I still have her picture on my dresser in my bedroom today. Uh, we went to school. Uh, it was a one-room school. Has This is the whole school. I don't know how the teacher managed. Um, I don't think I learned anything very... Oh, I am in the sec... I don't know if you can recognize me. <laughs> I don't look quite the same. That's, that's me over there. And uh, as you can see, there were too many kids, and was one teacher, I don't know how she managed. We didn't learn anything very much. But uh, I was happy to go to school with something to do. And in spite of that, we were still afraid. My brother kept telling me, don't worry, if they come, we'll just run into the woods. So <clears throat> we were there for about 18 months. And as soon as the Americans liberated Paris, uh, my parents were told where we were. They did not know where we were. They had not been told the whole time. We, we could not communicate with them. We would uh, send a letter to a central, to some place, a central location. They sent it to my parents and vice versa. So as soon as uh, the <clears throat> Americans came, uh, my parents were told where we were and they came to get us. And we went back to Avignon for a while until the, until the, uh, it was, a peace was, uh, so the, until the war was over. And we, that, was, that took about a year. And then we went back to Paris. And uh, in 1949, we were we had been on a quota for many years before the before the war, and in 1949 we were reached and uh, uh, we came to the United States, and we went to Brooklyn and I lived in Brooklyn all this time until I came here seven years ago. Can I just say one other thing? Um, my experiences were the experience of a child growing up. I recently read a book from, written by the daughter of a woman who also came to Shanghai, but she was, I think, 19 or 20 years old when she came, came there. And her outlook or emotions were different than mine. I didn't have to worry about providing food. That was my father's job. Uh, and so her experiences as an adult 
different than mine. I'd also like to say that um, the refugee uh, situation, uh, although the refugees now are not Jewish, is really, really bad. I, yesterday I watched TV and they were saying that I think there were still 600 or 3,000, no one really knows, children separated from their parents here in the United States. And uh, it's been uh, two years on the new administration and they're looking for people uh, the, to reunite the children with their parents, but there's still so many separated. And not, nothing has really changed in the world, I think. Okay, then we're opening it up to all questions. And, but before we do, I'd like to remind uh, Walter of one thing. Um, Helen told us about the righteous Gentiles that helped her. There was a Japanese yes. gentleman. Uh, he was the consul in, I think, Latvia, or, possi or possibly Estonia, who, over the objections of his government, issued transit visas. And uh, I think uh, something like 2,000 uh, Jews escaped from German occupation or from Poland and were able to travel across the Siberia, uh, across the Soviet Union, to Vladivostok, where they took ship and went to Japan and from there dispersed uh, to a final destination. Many of them came to Shanghai, including my grandparents. And his name, I think, was Sigahura. That's his picture there. And um, I have my grandparents' passport. And the visa is in it. When did you get married? Where did you land up? What did you do in your life and a career? As I said, I was 14 when I came, so I went to high school right away. And uh, it was a very good experience going to high school in Brooklyn. And um, I met my husband, Ted, um, when I was 20. And uh, I knew him for a few weeks when we got married. <laughs> everybody said, everybody said it's not going to last. We've been married for, what is it, 67 years? So I guess it lasted. Um, as I said, I went to a school and then um, I went to college and I became a, a French teacher. And uh, <laughs> I taught French for 25 years. And it was in Brooklyn all, all that time. And uh, Brooklyn is a very nice place, and I, I miss it. I'm very happy here, but the weather is much better. <laughs> and I have a son here and grandchildren. So, uh, but uh, I was very happy in Brooklyn. Do you, because of your background and... <clears throat> Did, is your friend, do you speak French without an accent, just like you speak English you without speak an accent? Fr Actually, I speak English better than I speak French. Oh, I <laughs> My French is old. And yeah. French, it, as you all know, I'm sure languages change. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've been away for many, many years. Um, I think I speak it perfectly, I but you. my cousin in France said I, I had an American accent. So. Oh, what, what does she know? <laughs> Nobody else said that, but that's what my cousin said. But listen, yeah. uh, different people. But my English is definitely better because it's up to date. Yeah. I try to read. Uh, I've been trying to read French, in fact, because I, I look up a lot of things and they know, they know me. I keep getting uh, newspaper articles in French when I get on, on my uh, tablet every day. So I read it. And yeah. yeah, there's a lot of words. There's a lot of, well, they're using a lot of English words now, you know. And uh, it's, it's different. Uh, I would like to ask Walter, the last I heard of your story is you were in Richmond with your family. And could you catch us up a little bit from Richmond to what happened after that? He did. The Jewish communities settled us in Richmond. We lived in um, housing that was built for war workers who built the ships in Richmond. And I commuted 
from Richmond to San Francisco uh, by Greyhound bus at first, and uh, worked uh, out in the Mission District in San Francisco, and enrolled at um, Commerce Adult High, went to night school, uh, never really completed my high school education, because as I said, the Army got me. But while I was in the Army, I took the Yusafi courses, which are high school equivalents, and uh, got my high school e equivalent um, degree uh, certificate. Um, in 1951, I married, and we had uh, have three children. Uh, we're kind of scattered family. My elder son lives in Toronto. Mm -hmm. After having lived in Israel for many years. My next child, our son, now lives in Vallejo, selling insurance, and my daughter lives in Martinez and is getting married uh, in July. I'm not sure whether it's the second or third time now. <laughs> well, marriage was legal for, for her for many years. Um, and I moved here, I think, eight years ago. Um, retired from Prudential, and uh, oh, I also went to uh, San Francisco City College at night while I was working, uh, and ultimately San Francisco State, where I got a BA in business management. Uh, in the off time, I sold shoes at Macy's in the basement in San Francisco. So, so in the morning I fixed adding machines. In the three nights a week I went to school. The other two nights I sold shoes, and Saturday morning I sold shoes. So Sunday I devoted to my family. I wanted to ask Walter, has he ever gone back to Austria where he came from? What was it like? I've been back to Austria a few times. Uh, the last time I was there when my aunt died, so my brothers and I went for the funeral. We've also been uh, invited by the Austrian government as a kind of, uh, to make good again. Uh, and um, and uh, I have a picture of uh, my brothers and me and the then president of Austria in a very fancy palace. Um, it, it's, uh, it's a beautiful country, I'm glad I'm not there. <laughs> Why? 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 I don't feel safe. They'll be here for a few minutes if you want to come up and uh, speak with them. And thank you so much for sharing your story.